guess I'll go first, I guess. Um, hi, everybody. Um, so to start, I want to let everybody know that I come from this from a different perspective. I come from community. I am community. And I've been taught to actually speak from my heart. So you'll never see me with a presentation, ever. Um, I have had really good people who have tried that for me, and they will not do it anymore for me because I don't follow them. <laughs> so, free land. So for me, it's very simple. It's very, very simple for me as an Indigenous woman. Um, I've always been taught that we don't own the land. The land owns us. And I have a responsibility to that land. I have a relationship with that land. And it's an equal relationship. It's my responsibility to ensure that I am the steward of that land. And that land will provide my sustainability throughout my life. And then when time comes and I do take that last breath, then I too will return to that land. So, I'm in an urban context. I am the executive director of a friendship center, and I work to support over 60 programs that provide programming to our urban indigenous peoples. So I do everything from prenatal right through to end of life care in the urban context. A lot of what we do, well, let's, uh, uh, let's be honest, every one of those programs I can connect back to colonization, impact of colonization. So I unfortunately, I do love my job, but it's really tough some days to actually do my job because I watch our people die, I watch our kids take their lives, I watch the institutions consume our people. It's not a justice system at all. My community makes up 4% of the population, but yet we're making up 40% of the homeless peoples. So we undertook the opportunity to actually build a new friendship center. We were told, manage your expectations. Don't dream too big. Stick to what you know. And I am a believer that we actually should be dreaming big. We don't stick to what we know, good thing. And we're now in the possession of land that our city has given it back to us for a dollar. First, they wanted us to buy it. And we had a long conversation on that. But even the fact that we have to pay a dollar for our own land, because it's on seated territory in which we're on, it's our land. We never gave it up, ever. It is on ceded Mi'kmaq territory. Then it started, how do I make sure, as I talk to my community and I talk to my elders, how do we make sure that what we're doing today is gonna to be here for seven generations? Because that's how we should be thinking. It's not the moment, it's not now, it's certainly the past, where are my ancestors in this, where are my people today, and where do I want my people to be tomorrow and into the future. So there was lots of opportunity. People wanted to have a say in this, and I have great elders, and I'm very thankful for all of them. They remind me all the time and put me in my place sometimes, where I need to be sometimes that we have traditional ways. The systems that we're in have been designed to actually hold us back. They've been designed, certainly in Canada, because I, I don't know if everybody knows that I'm, I'm actually from Canada. Um, we have three times the amount of kids in care today that we did in residential schools. We have our justice uh, population um, is increasing, our young women in particular. Um, in the institutions have increased by 30% over the last 10 years. So we have some issues. But then I've also seen on the flip side what land-based learning can do and what our, our reconnection can do for our community. 
I've seen young men who have been institutionalized their entire life, who have been able to reconnect with the land, relearn their role as a stewardship person, an individual. And I've seen them change dramatically because they all of a sudden they knew who they were, what their connection was, where they belong, and they become proud of who they are. And now today they're giving back. So the free land for me and for my community in particular in Halifax, I think government will tell you that we own uh, eight properties. We actually own all of it. But that eight, those eight properties, we're trying to find a way to ensure that that land will always be there for generations to come. We had a lot of gentrification happening where we are at. I had a lot of people offering to buy what we had. And it couldn't be my decision whether we kept it or sold it. So we had community meetings, we had community gatherings, we had elders. We had sweats, we had on the ground, in, in, in community conversations. And it came to the point that they all want the same thing. They want that land to own itself. They want that land to be my equal in what we're doing and how we move forward together. So for us, it's about falling back to our past and relearning, because let's be honest, colon we're, we're on the East Coast, so colonization began first. We were, were the very first point of contact. So we've, we've, we've lost our language, a lot of our cultural pieces. Really thankful we have very strong elders and who remain quiet quite often, but they hold that knowledge and it's starting to come but it's also about making sure that my great, 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 great grandchildren are looked after. And it's make sure that that land has its right and a say in how we do things. Let's be honest, we've, we've been miserable at caretakers of the lands that we have today. We've been, I think the only thing that makes me even a little bit Optimistic for the future is I've seen how quickly our lands can heal. We had wildfires last year and we had floods. And I walked through some of the forest areas that we had lost. And it's amazing how quickly that green growth all of a sudden is coming up. So it's amazing how quickly she can look after herself if we let her do her thing. So I know I only have five minutes and I could talk about this stuff all day. Um, and I'm gonna pass this off. So if there's anything that I would like for you to take away from this conversation is close your eyes, put your hand out in my hand. Now let's take the leap of faith. Let's do it together because I do believe it can be done and it will be done. It's just a matter of time and how we're going to do it. Well, I'll be able. Thank you. Um, you know, I feel like a thorn between roses. <laughs> so. I heard someone say earlier, my head is spinning swimming and I have to say I'm probably at that same pond. <laughs> Coming in from Hawaii in the middle of the sea, um, we call it the blue continent. Coming from the blue continent to the green ocean, the forests of turtle life. And based on what I've seen with water and the flows and the flooding, it does speak to the legends of why this is turtle life. It submerges and comes back every now and then. Which is a concept of time. And so I like to frame my comments uh, with that in mind, time. 
I think you mentioned some of that earlier. Because in the time that we have been experiencing this notion of property, we can go back to a prior time when there's no such thing. It's a foreign concept for those of us who come from a land and a place where there was no such thing. I've scoured our, our ancestral knowledge and wisdom and there's no word for property. There's no word for ownership. There are concepts that speak about rights and responsibility. If there's a close word, it's kuleana in Hawaii. Kuleana, which really speaks to the idea that I have rights and privileges only when I live up to certain obligations and responsibilities. Do not seek out the rights until you've lived up to your obligations. Not just to one another, but to the place itself. In fact, there's the discussion. We have an old proverb that says, Heli uh, kaina ikawa kekanaha. It basically says the land is chief and the people are its servant. That establishes order, establishes relationship. The conversation that we have in property today is a transactional discussion. But in our community, we talk about land, it's a relational discussion. Relation and transaction. And oddly enough, the stronger your relationships, perhaps the more smoothly your transactions. It is about identity. And to frame this in, in this way is because because we did not have it. This is a foreign concept. It continues to be a foreign concept. And some of you have mentioned it, and I think we subscribe to the same belief that it is a fiction. Whatever is a legal fiction or something else, and someone else or certainly bought the laws earlier. And the two things I took from the, that conversation was enforcement of law and law or enforcement. In the absence of enforcement, what is that? See, for us, laws is simply and has always been land, air, water, and spirit. Those are the initial laws. And as long as we subscribe to and honored those laws, we were living in harmony. There was a communion. These other laws are less about communion and more about compliance. Where we're living in complement, we're not living in competition. This speaks about relationships. And though I may have a name and we call ourselves, but in prior times, our kupuna, our elders would say, Hey, Hawaii, I am Hawaii. I am this place because I eat her and she eats me. My nutrition, my identity comes from the food and the water. My ancestors are in this land as I will be in it too. And my descendants shall be me as I am them. The time before and the time after. My ancestors and my descendants. The always, the past, and the forever that is coming. Always and forever. But none of that means anything until we live in the now. I can always contemplate what I've done and anticipate what's about to come. It's all about memory. Those are the past and those we're about to create. But fundamentally, until I get past the now, there will be no forever. Now or never. It is always in the now. And in the now, at this moment, we are managing the impacts of our past behaviors upon a screen of future behaviors. And we define much of that in the term of resources while we look at it as relatives. It's all relative. It's relational. So in addition to being the director of the Pacific Island Leadership Institute at the Hawaii Pacific University, I also serve as a role as a cultural sustainability planner with one of the number one planning firms in Hawaii, which allows me to engage developers and individuals who are coming to Hawaii to do, well, no one comes to the islands with a Failing proposition. <laughs> no one comes, I screwed up there, I'm going to do it better here. We're always going to have a better proposition. So let's start at the beginning, which is how do you leave us better 
when you leave? How do you leave us whole and not in one? So the conversation is always about that. For, for As a consultant, then, I lead with questions. And so as I leave the floor and move on to the rest of the day, I ask these questions. From the perspective, a point of view, an island worldview versus a continental worldview. In the island worldview, I'd ask the question, how many of you recently sold your mothers? Or are interested in selling your mother? Or how many of you are buying mothers today? Or buying your mother? See, the foundation of the question is, how can you own something you're from? See, we not only descend from ancestral thought processes, but we ascended from the Aina. We don't call it land. You know, that's the definition today. But in our Aina, in our language, our Olelo Hawaii, we call it Aina. Everyone say Aina. Aina. Ai, that which feeds. A-I, fire. E, water. Put those together. Food and steam. Ai, that which feeds. Now is a plural, as in more. So aina means tomorrow, not yesterday, tomorrow. So when we say aina, we're saying anything that gives us identity, anything that feeds us mentally, spiritually, emotionally. And I come from the aina. This is who I am. And so if we are going to be family, this is mother. Someone mentioned climate change. Yeah, I think it's change. We're in crisis now. But if you take this personification, understand that this is mother. How do I own what I come from? How is that possible? So this is a fiction that we're still trying to understand because we're just moving around furniture in the room. And we keep bringing more furniture in and making it much more complex. So for us, the object of the perspective would be simply this. In terms of land, who was it that just spoke about the ocean coming back and all the Yulia, thank you. I was at a recent conference and that was all about that. It was about land, property, who's gonna, whose house gets built first, how much they get for it, etc. But not once in that entire conversation did they talk about the ocean. They talked about the impacts on us and everything else, but they never talked about the ocean. See, for us, ocean is mother. That's where we come from. So my question would be, and it was this group, if you were told your mother was coming home, grandmother was coming home, would we be making accommodations for her or would we be building walls to keep her out? <coughs> See, that's the relational part. And the minute we pose that question, the entire dynamics of the conversation shifted because she is coming home. It is coming home. <coughs> and what are we doing to receive her? Or are we building walls to keep her up? Or are we driving lines that separate? So I'll close with this. In the natural world, we heard it earlier, the natural versus the spiritual intelligence. And now we have our artificial intelligence. We live in the natural space and the natural time, but we do a lot of our work in the artificial space and the artificial time. If there's anything we're doing, I'm here, if anything, to conduct what we call Ho'oponopono, the process of making right, to put things in alignment, because clearly what we're experiencing from our perspective is a misalignment. How do we realign? How do we get there? So if we intend to end right, we should start right. And I think the way to do that is to clear the slate. To open the door, to create this opportunity for mind and heart to come together. In my opening Oli, the chant you heard me say, it was simply this. To unify mind, body, and spirit. To acknowledge that we're all connected. They're all in the same canoe. In Hawaii, we see the island is a canoe and the canoe is an island. And I suggest that the earth is the island. If that's the case, then we're all in the same canoe. But where are we going? And can we get there together? So let me close with this. This whole point of the spirit of Aloha, which is reciprocity and leading us whole. 
and Ho'oponopono of making right. Please forgive me and my ancestors for whatever we may have done to create in your lives and your ancestors the eha, the pain and discomfort that actually brought us here together so that we could make these things right. Whatever that was, intentionally or unintentionally, action or inaction, please forgive us for whatever that was. In the spirit of aloha and reciprocity, my ancestors and I forgive you and your ancestors. For whatever it is you've done to create the heba, the pain, the discomfort in our lives, to the point that we need to come to spaces like this so that we can make these things right. Because until we do that, it's not right. Eo, make sense? So it is with that Allah and that reciprocity that we invite you to join us. And understand that allow us to be hosts, not servants, as the land hosts us as its servants. As we talk about free land and land ownership, know this, when you come to an indigenous community, it's either by invitation or invasion. And right now, many of these thoughts, these concepts, have been imposed upon these communities, who by our own definitions have difficulty understanding how any of these things can even be real. These manufactured concepts. And if I would think about it from an elder standpoint, that we allow our infants, our children, and our adolescents to have imaginary friends. We allow that maturity to grow. But have we reached a level of maturity to recognize that much of our infantile and adolescent behaviors have brought us to the point where we're at today? I think mother has been very patient with us. And so have our elders. And thank you for being patient and allowing me to share this with you. Aloha. Hello. My name is Maureen Margill. I'm with the Center for Democratic and Environmental Rights. Um, and I'm here to speak about Rights of Nature and the Land That Owns Itself project. Our founders of our organization, of which I am one, uh, we started our work as activists really trying to do something really simple, that is to protect the environment. Um, and we found that it was terribly complex um, and close to impossible. What we learned through our activist and legal journey is that nature in the spirit of today's conference, nature is property under the law. That's how it is treated under legal systems around the world. Um, and our environmental laws, therefore, of which we have thousands, are about regulating how we use that property, i.e. nature. And so we have environmental laws, and federal environmental laws in this country are actually enacted under Congress's authority under the Commerce Clause, of the Constitution, and he's nodding over here because he knows that's where labor comes from as well. Nature is treated as a part of commerce. Labor is treated as a part of commerce. That's where Congress gets its authority to pass environmental laws because nature is property. And so we have laws that legalize the use and exploitation of the natural world. So laws that legalize blowing off the tops of mountains in West Virginia, laws that legalize fracking and contaminating millions of gallons of water at every frack well, laws that are environmental laws and we think are therefore to be protective, but are actually about exploiting nature to as quickly as we can. So as activists seeking to protect the environment, we realized that we couldn't protect nature under a system that treated it as property because that was a system that was never designed to protect nature in the first place. You can't look to that very system that is exploiting nature to actually protect nature. So for us, we came to a place where we were no longer willing to work under that system. It simply wasn't there to protect nature. It was there to exploit it and harm it. Environmental laws legalize environmental harm. So looking to those laws was a practice of insanity to us. So we moved to a place where we determined that we have to change how nature itself is treated under the law. From being treated as property without legal rights, even the most basic right of all, which is the right to exist, to be, 
to moving nature to become recognized as a living entity with legal rights, moving from property to rights bearing, from rightless to with rights. And we've had this kind of transformation in the law, of course, before, in which humans that were treated as property, enslaved people, women, moving them through mass movements to go from being property to being recognized as people with their own rights and freedoms. So we've been through this process before, and that's where nature is today, existing as property. So we worked on the very first laws anywhere in the world to change that, that is to move nature from being property to being recognized as a living entity with legal rights, including that most basic right to exist. In Pennsylvania, in a small town called Tamaqua, in 2006, the very first right of nature law anywhere was developed by my colleague Thomas Lindsay, who isn't any here today. That first rights of nature law has now led to, and took us to places like Ecuador, where we assisted in drafting their new constitution, the first and the only one so far in the world, to enshrine that nature has constitutional rights, including a right to exist, to regenerate, to evolve, to be restored. Today, there are national laws recognizing the rights of nature in places like Bolivia, and Panama, and Uganda. Courts in Colombia, and India, and Bangladesh have recognized rights of rivers and other ecosystems and species. In the United States, dozens of communities now have recognized that nature possesses legal rights. And First Nations and tribal nations in Canada and the United States have also built the rights of nature into their indigenous governance systems. So this is a growing movement that has, over the past 15 years, gone global. And what it does is it represents a very fundamental shift in humankind's relationship with the natural world, in which we recognize that we are part of nature and that we're dependent on nature. And moving nature into a place where it possesses legal rights has been where our work is focused in the public sphere. That is, through law, through policy making, through court cases, litigation. But we also knew that there was a whole private sphere that we needed to move into. And so building on recognizing the rights of nature in laws in the public sphere, and government, we began working with landowners to recognize the rights of nature on their land. And we've done that, uh, these first rights of nature conservation easements in Hawaii and in Pennsylvania, and now in Washington State. So private landowners saying, I understand that this needs to transition from being my property over which I get to decide what happens here, to the nature itself on my land having the right to exist, the thrive, and that those rights are legal and they're enforceable. And we're doing that through rights of nature conservation easements. But we also recognize that that also isn't enough, that we need to move even beyond there. And so over the past several years, we developed a program that we call the Land That Owns Itself. And we developed a pilot project in Washington State in which we worked with a private landowner that wanted to not only recognize the rights of nature on their land through a rights of nature conservation easement, but then take that next leap, that is, recognizing that nature has these rights to be healthy, robust, resilient. But that next big leap is that nature begins to be not only self-governing, self-managing, but self-owning. So for the very first time in the United States, we've now worked with a landowner to give his land to nature itself and created a legal system in which nature is now self-owning. So nature is its own, it's autonomous, moving itself out from under human management in which we treat nature as a natural resource, as property. And so we move from nature being property to nature having rights, both in the public sphere and in the private sphere, and now ultimately that nature is itself land owning. So the land that owns itself. We have now come together with several organizations including Ramsey on the advisory board and Cassandra um, back there, Cassandra Ferreira. Several organizations have come together to form a program that we call Sacred Contract. 
in which we're going to be working with more landowners and are already doing that in places like Colorado and Oregon and elsewhere, in which landowners more and more, and somewhat to our surprise, want to move their property into self-ownership so that nature is self-owning. Um, and working with them to go through a process of moving that to recognize the rights of nature through a conservation easement and ultimately into self-ownership at the same time as beginning to understand what is the history of this particular piece of land? What is the indigenous context? Whose traditional lands are there? And when we decide who, what guardians are going to be there to be able to help protect this land, what context are they working within? And so that's the work that we're doing. It's making a fundamental shift in human relationship with the natural world, a fundamental push on truly capitalism. And you can understand that the pushback that is happening now is not unexpected. We have like states in like Florida, for instance, in Idaho, uh, my neighboring state to Washington, in which you have state legislatures who are passing preemptive laws that restrict and prohibit communities from adopting rights of nature laws. So they're taking away the ability of communities to put in stronger environmental protections than what is occurring at the state level. This isn't new, it's just now being applied to this idea that communities actually want to do something different than our conventional environmental laws which legalize environmental harm. And so that's the project space that we're in. Um, and we would love to hold a breakout if people are interested in learning about the land that owns itself and what rights of nature are um, today or tomorrow. Thank you.